Okay, uh, welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk. Uh, but if you have questions, you can unmute and ask questions or use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in training session at the end. Uh, second, uh, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences. So no classified discussion is allowed here. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. Uh, that's about it. Now, let me briefly introduce our speaker today. I, I will try to be brief. Um, I mean, George is pretty successful, so it's, it can be pretty long, but let me try. All right. It is an honor to host Dr. George Bolas, who is the Fred Whitney Endowed Chair Professor and director in advanced systems uh, engineering with the chemical and biomolecular uh, the engineering department at the University of Connecticut. Prior to uh, joining University of Connecticut, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the MIT. And before he received his bachelor's degrees and uh, doctoral degree in chemical engineering from the Aristotle University um, in Greece, uh, he's inter his interdisciplinary research uh, merges the fields of energy technology, process systems engineering, and model-based system engineering. Uh, his laboratory pursues a balanced approach to information theory for the design, optimization, control, operation, and maintenance of cyber physical systems with applications on energy, chemical industry, manufacturing, naval, and the aerospace industry. Dr. Bolas, he's the uh, recipient of numerous awards, such as NSF Career Awards and many others. And he managed a portfolio of over 7 million in, in his research uh, groups, research projects, while his institute managed active um, research funding that totals over $30 million. Okay, today George will talk about physics informed machine learning through symbolic regression. Please enjoy and expect a wonderful talk. Now, let me um, ask a couple of questions to George um, just to get to know uh, him better and make this seminar somewhat informal. Okay, first question here it goes. Obviously, you are passionate about symbolic regression and uh, scientific machine learning in general. Um, uh, when and how did you get into this field and started to do research on, on them? Sure. What an excellent question. It's a long story. I'll try to make it short. Um, I actually, at the, at the end of uh, this presentation, I'm presenting the use of symbolic aggression to discover the fault cause of uh, uh, heat exchanger uh, for heat exchanger fouling. And how it progresses with time. We were working on uh, fault detection and isolation using information theory and principles of design of experiments. <clears throat> and um, we we're optimizing the system and the conditions. And at some point, someone, uh, a partner from uh, uh, the um, industry we're uh, working with, uh, asked, What if we do not just optimize the conditions? What we optimize the function that actually is used to detect the fault? Uh, that is called differential sensors or uh, soft sensor and so on. And we actually started working on symbolic regression to create functions that um, uh, maximize the information with respect to a fault in the system, the evidence of a fault in the system. Mm. And from there, we expanded it to uh, uh, fault cause. And from there, we expanded it to actually discovering the physics. Nice, nice. OK, here is a. Second question, you are quite successful and established now in terms of portfolio and funding. Is there any secret for this? Uh, good partners and entering a partnership with uh, goals that relate to success for everyone and uh, real excitement about the research you're doing. All right, thank you for sharing the secret. Okay, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yung Xu, and uh, I'm honored to be invited to give this uh, webinar. Uh, I'll uh, discuss physics and machine learning through symbolic regression and some of the progress uh, that we recently have made on, on this field. I'll uh, start by providing some context of uh, why we're doing this um, um, and what's the role of AI in the context of cyber physical systems and why we need glass box models and interpretable models. Uh, this slide is actually from uh, one of the course that I teach. And, um, 
Uh, there I discuss about the concept of analogous systems models. Uh, there is a few very interesting books that uh, try to generalize modeling uh, as a concept across disciplines. Um, the slide shows examples of uh, transla translational mechanical system, rotational mechanical system, electrical system, hydraulic system, and you can expand that to chemical systems and so on. And the whole point is that pretty much the same set of differential equations, the same structure or functions describe any system uh, in the physical world. And uh, you can expand this to partial differential equations for more advanced systems and uh, also uh, 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 expand in the spatial domain. Uh, so if we could discover these equations from data, then we would be discovering the real truth, the uh, uh, truth about systems uh, from, from the data and we'll be discovering uh, these physical laws from data. That's uh, really the drive force uh, for, for in what we do. Another reason why we're doing it is uh, this is an example from uh, uh, a manufacturing system from precision machining. On the left hand side is a manufacturing system that doesn't manufacture very well. That's why you see the sparks and the smoke and uh, it also has audio. I don't know if it plays. <clears throat> it makes uh, too much noise, the left hand side. Um, process where the right hand side process is almost perfect and uh, uh, in machining and the uh, reality is that the left hand side has a tool that is warm but um, you don't know until you take it out and you measure it under a microscope um, and um, there is a lot of thousands of papers and a lot of research on how to uh, actually infer the condition of the tool in precision machining and um, uh, uh, the reality is that the manufacturing floor productivity requires more aggressive machining that actually deteriorates uh, the tool even faster, and um, uh, uh, that requires an accurate digital twin. So you're trying to infer something that uh, you never measure out of uh, other types of data, and at some point we realize that there is valuable data in the physics that relate to the forces, friction, and power consumed uh, that is changing a little bit uh, because of uh, the tool being worn, but also there is uh, data in audio vibration of the machine and so on that uh, relate to physics that we never model. And um, uh, this type of data are extremely informative about the condition of the tool. So the idea was how do we actually merge models that are data driven and physics based in uh, assessing either tool condition or the state of the tool and generally speaking, creating digital twins for uh, cyber physical systems as in the example here. And the answer, of course, in everything nowadays is artificial intelligence and AI models and data driven models. Um, I'll just uh, go over some very basic definitions. According to IBM, artificial intelligence describes machines that mimic our cognitive functions such as learning and problem solving. And uh, some data that show that uh, um, it's projected to be a $10 trillion uh, market. Uh, um, pretty much will affect any any business in any domain. So for us engineers, it's, uh, uh, we are in a unique position to guide uh, AI development to accomplish our goals, which are to optimally control systems, uh, maintain these systems, decision-making, design, and so on. But uh, the problem with uh, AI alone is that uh, machine learning in the general context requires large amounts of data. Uh, big data may not always be useful or available for physics or engineering purposes, especially when we design new systems or systems that uh, we have uh, limited information about. Uh, so the question is, how would we, could we inject physics into machine learning to learn better models from less data? And this is how um, the general term physics in for machine learning is defined, how we inject uh, physics into a machine learning model or machine learning into a physics-based model. And we have uh, a potential observation bias, inductive bias, and learning bias that uh, would be filtered through some form of physics and machine learning to address issues like or opportunities or system specifics like symmetry, conservation laws, or dynamics. Um, so this beautiful image shows, uh, created by Donald Jorgensen from uh, BNNL, shows a high-level idea of what this looks like. On the left-hand side, we have equations that we understand and we derived over hundreds or thousands of years of studying systems. And on the right-hand side, we just have data and we try to figure out what are best ways to combine that. To give you an example, and I'll be going over uh, um, chemical reactor examples extensively, it's my field, and um, as I mentioned, the presentation and the approach is not really focused on chemical systems, but we use chemical systems mostly because uh, we are very familiar and comfortable with those. 
A dynamic plug flow reactor equation, when I was teaching undergraduates in the classroom, I would start by saying that uh, there is an accumulation term for the concentration C. There is a diffusion term that uh, uh, is, um, describes the change of concentration because of uh, the driving force of the differ uh, concentration differences. A convection term that describes force convection, forced movement of a material, and then a reaction term is a chemical reactor. And in uh, many cases, we'd like to uh, inject that knowledge into our machine learning approach, say it's a chemical reactor, so I expect it to have accumulation, diffusion, convection, reaction, or discover something from which we'll identify that these terms exist there, so it must be a plug flow reactor out of the data, if I didn't know what type of reactor it is. It's central to communication with uh, other experts and stakeholders to have uh, interpretable or glass box models, and also, it's they're extremely helpful in explaining the what, the how, and the why of a system operates the way it operates. It becomes more and more a requirement by federal agencies as well. So I'm giving you just examples of the FDA that uh, requires that uh, uh, an appropriate model should be uh, plausible, consistent with current knowledge, and have mathematically identifiable parameters. That's not the case in many of the black box uh, data-driven models or it becomes more and more of the focus of uh, FAA um, uh, where uh, to approve data, approve the data, not the analytical te technique and the applicant must show the data are valid. In many cases that can be shown through a model and you exchange information through uh, the model that generates the, this data and having that model being interpretable and explainable helps a lot uh, with the justification. I'll cover very quickly some of uh, the common tools, modern tools for equation discovery. Uh, we'll try to discover equations out of data in this presentation, in the vast majority of this presentation. Uh, what created a lot of noise a few years ago and extremely successful in uh, many different implementations and applications is uh, sparse regression, uh, called, uh, a tool called Cindy. Um, the idea is that uh, we are aware of uh, some phenomena, let's say this x, x squared, x cubed, or the diffusion, convection, and so on in my previous example, and, uh, but we don't know how these are combined and how these actually formulate the model. Uh, so we form a sparse regression problem where we try to identify which terms and with which parameters they need to be multiplied with so that we can um, uh, uh, discover the model, the governing equations of a system. And a little bit more advanced appro approach and also uh, uh, somewhat older is genetic programming or genetic algorithms that uh, uses an argument set uh, of variables, let's say X, Y, Z, and a primit primitive set of operators, let's say, say in this example, plus uh, product and cosine. And uh, through uh, manipulation, combination of those and then mutation and crossover, uh, it creates uh, uh, trees of these expressions and combinations of these expressions. It follows, it mimics uh, evolution theory, and it worked for humans and animals. So, in principle, it should work for discovering occasions as well. Uh, so, we'll be focusing on genetic programming and uh, symbolic regression specifically, but uh, there are some uh, interesting approaches that actually combine uh, neural networks with symbolic regression. Uh, for instance, the uh, PIN approach, PINN approach, um, for an example, in Berger's equation, forms a neural network that estimates the state variables, and then that estimate of the state variable is used in some form of uh, sparse regression to, uh, or possibly even symbolic regression, to generate expressions for the derivatives of that state variable. It takes advantage of the automatic differentiation to inexpensively uh, estimate derivatives of the state variable, and in that sense, it avoids uh, the expensive step of uh, integration of that state variable in space or time. Uh, it uses a normalization term to reduce uh, 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 terms that are um, not likely to be significant and uh, likely to uh, cause errors and uh, finds a solution in the form of some differential equations. Inverse pins uh, can have variable injection of domain knowledge that goes into the library and um, uh, the error depends on the quality of the surrogate, not the data, and um, the normalization um, chooses the most important uh, physics and it can go through many passes, so iterate through that alternate direction of optimization scheme, and that works also very well. Um, so that one implementation of that uh, is a deep mode that we'll discuss uh, later in, in one of the applications that we'll show. I'm not a big fan of discussing tools, but uh, in computer science you have to go over those. Uh, we work uh, 
uh, originally with DIP, the distributed evolutionary algorithm in Python. That's pretty much a scaffolding for genetic, uh, custom genetic programs and other evol evolutionary algorithms. Nowadays, we uh, use a little bit more uh, by, uh, by SR that uh, uses uh, islands of expressions and allows exchange of uh, um, uh, functions and uh, 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 results uh, between these islands of expressions and there is other tools like uh, deep symbolic regression and I think you know, this comes from your group where there is a sequencing uh, generated by recursive neural networks that go into genetic programming to, uh, to generate functions. Uh, I will be comparing many different methods, including uh, what we've done, and I will be comparing based on uh, some metrics for uh, the um, success of in uh, discovery of a model. Uh, so uh, the one would be uh, how responsive or how it, uh, uh, a model discovered is sensitive to noise uh, from low to high. Uh, when it's uh, low, when it has low sensitivity to noise, then it will be good. So it will be shown with a green arrow. Uh, when it's uh, high sensitivity to noise, it will be bad. It will be with a, a red arrow point uh, down, um, down, pointing downwards. Uh, then we'll study how sensitive they are to data, data density or scarcity. Uh, then we'll discuss uh, how fast it is in actually discovering occasions. And then we'll also communicate uh, how creative it is, meaning if I didn't know what the basis functions are, if I had to discover uh, the, the functional form uh, that goes into, for instance, sparse regression, uh, how creative is the algorithm in actually discovering these functional forms, these basis functions. So I'll start with... Uh, uh, how we actually try to discover uh, truth, uh, ground truth from data. This is uh, a work by uh, Ben Cohen, a PhD candidate uh, with the uh, University of Connecticut. Uh, and uh, uh, ben, be ben has been very creative in actually uh, uh, combining many of these tools in, uh, with a goal to discover physics. Our focus there is mostly to discover the ground truth at any cost, and then from there see what uh, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong so that we can optimize uh, the process. Um, I'll show you a highlight and I'll go through some of uh, the uh, explanation of uh, um, how we uh, came up with this uh, overall classification. I'm showing you uh, uh, several different method classes, PDE, FINE, SGA, PDE, Wix, CINDY, TIPMOD, and DISCO PDE is our method. And I'm assessing it here and assessing all of this here in terms of uh, noise and scarcity and time. And uh, uh, overall, uh, no method is perfect, uh, but um, uh, all of these methods uh, target uh, simpler and smaller models compared to deep learning. And I'm uh, citing uh, Jan Lacuna at the top of the slides and uh, claim that deep learning is that long live uh, differential programming. And um, in essence, all these methods are applying some form of differential programming in the context of discovering partial differential equations out of data. Uh, so um, the good news is uh, many of these methods are relatively robust to data scarcity. And uh, uh, the more robust they become to data, data scarcity, they uh, become more significant, they have become at a significant cost in time. And the question that we asked ourselves is what can be done to improve interpretability and discovery? So how can we discover what we don't know and at the same time have it interpretable so actually uh, understand the results? So the challenge for us was to automatically discover, discover governing differential equation models from uh, noisy and scarce data. So in many cases, what I will be presenting is very simple systems where we try to uh, identify a couple of differential equations out of, out of their data. So this is this called PDE, as we call it, the uh, framework that we developed, and I'll be gathering it uh, 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 step by step. I'll start with, uh, as, as I move on with the slides, I'll start with an isothermal plug flow reactor example, a uh, differential equation that looks like that. I already went over that. This is accumulation term, this is the diffusion, this is the convection, and this is the reaction term, the square of uh, the concentration. Um, we assume that we know in initial condition that uh, there is no reaction when uh, the, uh, 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 the data start being collected, and we assume that we know the boundary condition. So the black box is the actual reactor, and uh, we don't know what the equations are, but we know that it's a chemical reactor, so we'll have reaction, diffusion, convection, and so on, and accumulation. And I'll, I'll go over uh, these steps of the, of the framework that we develop uh, step, step by step in the next few slides. 
So what we are trying to do here is to we'll assume that uh, there is a system that's dynamic. So there will be a dynamic term on the left hand side. And we'll assume that we don't know what the right hand side of the differential equation, the, the partial differential equation is. Uh, so that will become some S function of the concentration and many parameters that we need to estimate also at the same time. Uh, the way it works is by, uh, uh, generally speaking, in um, uh, symbolic regression is uh, one needs to define an argument set. In our case, we know it's a reactor, so we anticipate uh, uh, diffusion, uh, convection, reaction, and some feedstock um, uh, that uh, go in. Uh, then uh, in the primitive set, in this particular case, we allow plus minus a product. Uh, the reason for that is... Um, uh, to keep the problem simple and to avoid uh, overfitting and also because we are aware that uh, uh, if it's a chemical reaction system um, we wouldn't expect these terms to be combined with uh, cosines or exponential functions and so on we'll advance this as we move forward uh, anyway um, uh, the genetic programming hyperparameters are provided here and these are always the result of uh, tuning and experience with a particular system and the expression inclusion is, as I mentioned, that uh, the right hand side of the uh, uh, time dependent differential equation is to be discovered using the argument set and the primitive uh, set that uh, we provided. What we will measure is the uh, concentration of A of the reactant at the outlet of the reactor as a function of time. So this is uh, the concentration would be variable across the reactor as well as at the exit of the reactor, but we'll be having just one sensor at the exit of the reactor and we try to um, and discover the governing equation for the entire reactor. So this is the primitive set, the expression combination strategy, the genetic programming hyperparameters, and the data that we provide in, in the framework that um, uh, that we're using. Next, uh, uh, we will um, uh, start a discovery process. Uh, that in this uh, example we do in deep, and uh, we initialize the population. I'm giving you a dummy example here. For instance, CA minus uh, the convection terms times the diffusion term. This is obviously not a solution, but let's assume it starts with something like that. I'm giving you the um, graphical representation of what this looks like in, in uh, symbolic regression in deep. And we'll start with this initial population and uh, we'll set the initial population size to 100. That also uh, depends on uh, problem complexity and other specifics of the problem. And then uh, we'll start uh, building a model. Uh, so as soon as uh, we generate the tree, we will assign parameters to all these terms. And then we'll need to estimate these parameter values. To estimate these parameter values in this particular problem, we'll have to integrate. Integration is expensive. Uh, we use uh, Cassadi and uh, an OD solver in Cassadi, available Cassadi that comes from Sundials. Um, and um, um, uh, we do integration and parameter estimation, and then we uh, evaluate the fitness of the result of the CA, of the solution for CA, the concentration of uh, species A, um, using uh, the uh, Bayesian information criterion to not overfit uh, the data. And uh, uh, we provide this to evolution next. The evolution will do either crossover or mutation or any other of the functions that uh, genetic algorithms use and genetic programming uses. And I'm showing you an example of crossover and mutation here, but this is pretty standard and trivial things in uh, genetic programming. And through evolution, it will come up with a new model that it will build and uh, uh, and eventually uh, we'll do parameter estimation, integration, uh, evaluate the fitness against the data that we measure and uh, continue that loop until we have uh, um, uh, reached some minimum, uh, until we have reached uh, either the number of iterations that we allow or uh, some uh, uh, error uh, threshold. Uh, the result, the final result is here. Uh, we gave it uh, two different experiments. Um, uh, this is the measurement of the concentration at the exit of the reactor of species A. Uh, with time at uh, two different initial con uh, feed conditions, boundary conditions. And um, uh, this is also the squared error across the entire uh, domain of the reactor. So as a function of X as well. So it's very, very small, although we only measure the um, uh, data at the exit of the reactor. The reason for that is because we do the very expensive step of integration uh, uh, across the reactor length and, the react uh, and over time. So that was a trivial example, and to be 100% honest with you, that could have been done with sparse regression as well, because practically we knew all the terms, all the terms that we should inject it in, um, um, uh, in the uh, basis functions. 
to test it further, we said, let's say, as, let's actually test the hypothesis that uh, we know it's a reactor, we know it uh, performs a reaction, but we don't know the order of the reaction, and we don't know if it's a plug flow reactor or CSTR that have uh, very different governing equations. The ground truth for plug flow reactor is what we studied already. The ground truth for CSTR, it's a much simpler equation that uh, uh, is shown here. This is the right-hand right side um, of uh, the differential equation with respect to time, right? Uh, so we provided uh, two data series, uh, again, the exact same uh, uh, feed conditions, uh, concentrations for species A, and we ran it through the framework. And in 95% um, of the trials, we discovered almost the exact same um, occasion for the plug flow reactor. And for in 80% of the trials, we discover almost the exact same occasion for the CSTR, for the continuous stirred reactor. Uh, the small differences in uh, uh, the parameters are due to noise because we are injected uh, uh, noise with the never smoothed out and we fit uh, a little bit of the noise with it, but uh, it's very minor anyway. Uh, the elephant in the room, and I will discuss it, I'm not going to hide it, is that it takes about 20 minutes to discover this one differential equation, um, regardless of whether it's a, a CSTR or a PFR. Uh, then we took it one step farther. Uh, usually we don't have uh, uh, just one differential equation, so we wanted to explore what it looks like when we have, uh, let's say, a coupled mass and energy balance, as we call it. So we have mass transport and energy tra transport and a chemical reaction. Uh, reaction. And the uh, argument set uh, for each one of these partitions is presented are presented here, as well as the primitive set. And uh, we uh, evolved uh, 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 two parallel uh, uh, functions uh, uh, using uh, an expression approach uh, that uh, 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 allows an expression to be evolved as a function of volume the concentration because we know there will be a mass balance as a function of volume the temperature because we know there will be an energy balance that's a function of temperature and then as a function of concentration and temperature because that's actually what uh, uh, usually a chemical reaction um, uh, depends on. Uh, the combination strategy was that uh, that we allowed was uh, that the uh, derivative of concentration with respect to time will be a function of S1 and S3 as defined in the expression trees and the uh, energy balance will be a function of S2, uh, S3. And uh, we assume that we know the, pre the uh, uh, kinetic constant of that reaction. That's actually not um, a wild assumption. You could know the kinetics of a reaction out of a completely different system and still try to discover the governing equations of a chemical reactor. Uh, so the two differential equations, uh, the right-hand side of the differential equations are um, uh, presented here. And what we recovered was pretty much identical to uh, the ground truth by evolving two uh, functions, uh, two differential equations in parallel. So that uh, worked uh, very well, uh, but uh, uh, it shows that we can actually evolve parallel, uh, several uh, partial differential equations in parallel, but uh, it doesn't address a few of the issues, as, as specifically the issues of uh, uh, time, uh, sensors, number of sensors, and scarcity, and so on. Uh, we took it one step further to study, uh, uh, to compare algorithms and how we do against uh, other common algorithms. What I'm presenting here is uh, deep mode and uh, weak Cindy against our framework. We have more comparisons, but this is uh, enough to at least uh, convey uh, our strengths and our weaknesses in as much honesty as I can. Uh, so uh, weak Cindy deals with uh, uh, integrates uh, using a weak formulation, so the integration step is extremely inexpensive compared to ours, and it also performs pass regression, which in practice here uh, almost uh, uh, translates to uh, linear regression, so it's extremely fast. Uh, so what you will see here is uh, weak Cindy, I'll start with the time. Uh, weak Cindy uh, performs uh, really, really well until it cannot perform, uh, it, can, it cannot discover anything anymore. Uh, uh, deep mode is uh, about uh, four orders of magnitude more computationally expensive, and ours is about five orders of magnitude more computationally expensive. So the elephant in the room is that once you do symbolic regression to discover a function that then you will integrate over space and time, you accept the fact that that integration is very expensive. 
and we address that. But at this point, I'll, I'll just state the obvious that we got this result and say, okay, we have a time issue. Like it takes it takes a long time. Uh, the the great news is uh, when we um, uh, estimated the error of the parameter estimates in this particular function to make it apples to apples for the comparison of uh, very different methods like Wix in the deep mode and our method. Uh, Wix in the failed after 46 sensors. So this is how many sensors we have in space. Uh, deep mode failed after eight sensors, whereas in our case, we could go all the way down to two sensors and, 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 and one sensor and still get uh, a model that uh, is accurate in terms of the parameters that we estimate. A very good representation of the actual truth of the ground truth of the um, uh, governing equation. So um, we provide improved discovery when data is scarce, but it's much slower than the alternatives. And that is what we try to address next. So I'll summarize uh, a few more efforts uh, uh, in uh, in comparing uh, different types of um, uh, methods. Uh, so uh, first of all, I would like to say that no method dominates. There is no perfect solution right now. Uh, avoiding data in uh, derivative or integral calculations helps with noise and data scarcity. Uh, in many of the approaches, like sparse regression, uh, the basic uh, CINDI or genetic algorithms, we use the derivative of the data as calculated by the data. That's extremely noisy. If the data are noisy, then the derivative is very, very noisy, and that doesn't help with uh, deriving accurate models. And um, um, the scientific discovery itself in some of these methods is very small in the context that if you know all the basis functions, that's great. You practically know your system. It's, a, it's sometimes just a linear regression problem, but what if you don't? Um, what I'm presenting here is sparse regression, which is the original same the genetic algorithms where also we use uh, finite differences of the data uh, to avoid integration. Integral um, uh, symbolic regression, that is weak Cindy, where we approximate the integration. Uh, with a weak formulation, uh, GA or programming with ODE solvers is our method where we actually integrated the data and then uh, pin based uh, symbolic regression is pretty much the deep mode result. And I'm showing the, the summary of uh, the performance of all these approaches uh, as a function of noise, scarcity, creativity, and time. And as I mentioned, there is no uh, good solution, but we noticed that in everything we do, we are very robust uh, to noise. We can work with uh, very uh, scarce data. Uh, it's symbolic regression genetic programs. It could be as creative as we allow it to be, but it's very computationally expensive as we discussed. Uh, so uh, the question that we asked after is, can we develop tools that are better at discovering free-form human interpretable differential equation models from scarce and noisy data and do it at the, uh, uh, in the context of uh, reducing the time that it takes for us to discover uh, these uh, models? And we are interested in time because very few systems are governed by one equation or two equations, and I'll show you examples with hundreds of equations later on. So um, uh, it, it's not going to scale well when it takes that long for one for the discovery of one equation. So I'll admit that our innovation here was very limited. We actually uh, learned from uh, PIN for physics and formula networks. And I'll go over uh, what we did there and how we started comparing methods and how we stole some of the ideas to apply them in a symbolic regression. That's work by Nazi Aslan, a New York student in my group, uh, working on uh, PNN. Uh, Nazi is working with uh, a Modulus, uh, a tool out of NVIDIA, uh, that um, is uh, one very robust implementation of PNN. Um, the Fundamental idea of BANN is avoid integration at all costs, estimate the state variable and a, a, a extensive use of automatic differentiation to approximate the derivatives. If the derivative is known, then we do PANN and we constrain the solution subject to some differential equation that is uh, known. If the derivative, if the differential equation is partially unknown, for instance, the terms and so on, then it's called inverse uh, PANN, and uh, we estimate the parameters of that derivative using data, that differential equation using data, while the differential um, equation is uh, also used as a constraint or in the loss function. Uh, the uh, uh, Modulus has a very robust and smooth implementation. Later on, we'll be using PyTorch, another tool that uh, does the same, and I'm pretty sure there is uh, many other uh, uh, flavors of, of the same uh, basic idea of uh, BANN. So our concept was the inverse pins are designed for parameter estimation. The loss function uses some loss function of the data, how well the data are fit. Uh, fit. 
plus uh, whatever we know about the partial differential equation in the loss function and uh, estimates uh, parameters for that uh, partial differential equation, potentially some terms, and also fits the data. And this is done in traditional PNN using neural networks. So the key idea there is that um, automatic differentiation is used extensively. We can do the same with symbolic regression, and actually a little bit more inexpensively because the, all the uh, terms and functions that are generated from symbolic regression are smaller, so it's less effort for the automatic differentiation step. So we started with a simple example, and I'll go through uh, the summary of the results, and then I'll show you also some more details of these results. Um, so we uh, worked again with a PDE of an isothermal plug flow reactor. The equation that we try to discover is here. Uh, we generated uh, 20 uh, points or 100 points out of that equation, random points and with the same points. We tried to uh, ex experiment, we tried to uh, discover the uh, PDE using inverse pin or symbolic regression, uh, both employing automatic differentiation and pretty much the same type of uh, basic approach and uh, basic principles. 5% uh, noise was added to all the uh, experiments. And the predicted values of the parameters are like 0.5 and 1.3 are shown here um, uh, for uh, inverse pins, uh, of course, increasing the number of uh, uh, measure points increases the accuracy of the solution and for symbolic regression. And as I will actually highlight later, symbolic regression finds uh, smaller models with more accurate parameter estimates. Uh, the uh, um, the advantages and drawbacks is that the inverse pin with 100 points used about 8,000 parameters or 7,500 parameters, and it took uh, 73 seconds, whereas symbolic regression had only three parameters and it took 100 seconds, a little bit more time. But uh, in uh, the, with 100 points, it actually found the analytical solution. There is an analytical solution to that partial differential equation that I will actually uh, show it to you uh, later on. And so it actually discovered not just a very uh, small model, but the actual model that corresponds to the analytical solution to the parts of differential equation, which then is differentiated using automatic differentiation to uh, satisfy uh, the partial differential equation that we try to emulate. Uh, the overall evolution of the solution is presented here. It has been super fast finding a very good solution very early on. Symbolic regression will go through. Uh, some steps of figuring out what to do before it uh, finds a solution. So it's a little bit slower, as I mentioned, but uh, uh, not uh, uh, not too slow anymore, mostly because we're not doing integration, we're doing automatic differentiation. We really uh, use the same ideas in a different context. So uh, in terms of time and how long it takes to actually discover partial differential equations using symbolic regression, uh, we, had, uh, we had understood that, uh, um, that evaluating fitness is difficult and because it includes parameter estimation and um, uh, the integration step is very slow. So we'd like to either find easier fitness functions or integrate fewer times. One of our goals is actually to explore what we call sloppy integrators instead of accurate in integrators also, but also other uh, 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 approaches to the uh, simplify or to reduce the time, computational time, as such as uh, recognizing that there are known physics and we don't need to rediscover those, nor relearn those, and uh, focus on what is unknown. And I'll show you an example on, of that uh, in the next slide. Uh, one interesting approach is when we understand the physics well of a system, as for example in this type of um, uh, partial differential equation, that's again a, plug, a dynamic plug flow reactor, then we could actually simplify the equation that we try to discover, all the data based on our understanding of the equation of, that we try to discover. So in this case, what we did is we used the method of characteristics. It really takes the concentration at the exit of a plug flow reactor from the time domain and it plots it in the characteristic lines. And, uh, uh, and then what uh, was unknown here was uh, the uh, uh, reaction term. And for that, we actually played with uh, complicated functions that um, sparse regression could, uh, would not discover unless we, we were expecting this particular function. So uh, uh, kinetics that uh, look like that or kinetics that are actually functions of temperature and concentration or just the second order, uh, 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 second uh, power of uh, the concentration is simple kinetics. We use that because for that particular uh, case, there is an analytical solution to this partial differential equation, and we wanted to see if symbolic regression will find the analytical solution. 
So in all cases, the, uh, uh, the framework that we developed uh, actually uh, discovered the kinetics that uh, were unknown. And when the kinetics were uh, C-square and we were actually trying to uh, solve the problem using the method of characteristics, we actually found the analytical solution to the partial differential equation. So that is very beneficial because it's not just fitting data, it's actually discovering the ground truth, the real truth of a partial differential equation using just one sensor, but by simplifying the, the problem statement, how the problem is stated uh, by using uh, the method of characteristics. One could say that for us to apply the method of characteristics implies that we know the form of the equation, and that would be an accurate statement, but to some extent it shows how we can actually manipulate the data that we have to get uh, better representations of the data for the purpose of symbolic regression. Then we took it, uh, uh, then we uh, wanted to study what if we know some physics and we don't know some physics. So let's assume that we have a partial differential equation that the, uh, uh, it looks like that, uh, du dx plus uh, du dy uh, plus some uh, u and then uh, times uh, par uh, parameters and then plus u, but we don't know the function of u and uh, we have a lot of data for this function of u and the real function of u here is really what I show here, what was discovered by eventually by symbolic regression, this um, uh, function of signs and exponents, exponential functions of uh, x and y. Uh, so we generated uh, these data points that I'm highlighting here with crosses and we try to apply uh, symbolic regression with automatic differentiation of the function of u that we have here uh, automatic differentiation will give me the uh, automatically the uh, derivative with respect to x, the derivative with respect to y, the function of u, of course, and it will fit the data. Uh, we did this with symbolic regression and neural network. This is the example that I was showing you earlier with the pins and uh, symbolic regression. Uh, the benefits of symbolic regression is that we learn analytical solution and parameter values. Uh, better parameter estimates, uh, as I'm showing you here, compared to PINN and a few parameters the left model as I presented earlier compared to PINN. And, um, and to take it one step further, uh, what this did is we use automatic differentiation to get derivatives of solution proposed by SR, so we avoid integration altogether. We evaluate the partial differential equation using the analytical derivatives. When we apply automatic differentiation on this term, we actually get the analytical de derivative, the analytical solution derivative. and um, uh, and uh, we find the uh, optimal parameter values for uh, partial differential equation through parameter estimation. And of course, it applies the same principle that solution or the loss function is penalized, uh, includes the uh, partial differential equation, so it cannot be violated uh, significantly. Uh, we wanted to explore how this generalizes and uh, how this comparison generalizes uh, to other types of systems. So we tried an advection system and a Berger's equation. And this is the advection system. This is Berger's equation. Uh, in this particular case, what we did is we randomly took uh, 10 samples uh, uh, out of the solution of the advection, uh, the advection equations. Um, and 10 points randomly selected uh, with 5% noise added. And then uh, we uh, uh, performed 10 experiments, 10 synthetic experiments, virtual experiments, where we selected these 10, 10 points. Uh, because of the noise, uh, there was some distribution parameter estimates, so we assume there is a, a normal distribution that fits these parameter estimates, and what I'm presenting here is the normal distribution and the standard uh, uh, based on the mean and the standard deviation that fit the parameter estimates out of these 10 experiments, and I'm just presenting here the solution from symbolic regression and PANN. So symbolic regression gets closer to the real value, but what's more interesting is that it's a much narrower distribution for the parameter estimates over all these 10 experiments. Uh, uh, and the reason for that is a much smaller model. It's a much uh, more robust model. It's actually closer to the ground truth. Whereas when we did it in the Berger's equation, uh, it was um, relatively good symbolic regression at estimating uh, theta two, and uh, both models were very inaccurate as estimating theta one, the diffusion term. Um, I think the reason for that is that even the 5% noise as it's um, uh, translated after differentiating uh, the function u that uh, we estimate twice with respect to x um, uh, leads to very inaccurate estimates of the derivative that leads to inaccurate estimates of the parameter. 
but uh, in both cases, what we saw was that the symbolic regression was actually closer to the ground truth of uh, the parameter values theta one and theta two. And most importantly, that in all cases, symbolic regression gives models with uh, more confidence, uh, a smaller standard deviation. So we took uh, that and uh, um, as I mentioned, we had started uh, working from fault detection and uh, I'm gonna present very quickly uh, some work that relates to fault detection and how we can actually uh, find miss uh, miss missing physics uh, in uh, data when we have a very large scale model that we trust, but uh, a portion of the model that we don't know. That's work by Efi Safiku, uh, who's been working on, on the field of uh, fault detection, prognostics and diagnostics for quite a while with me. Uh, the idea was with an aircraft system, uh, heat exchanger fouls and that heat exchanger is responsible for uh, the pressurized air conditioning uh, kit that is responsible for the quality of air, temperature and pressure in the cabin. Um, so very important little system that's actually usually sits underneath the airplane. After I worked on this project, I never fly on an airplane without actually noticing where the heat exchanger is and uh, the quality of the air and, and so on. Um, uh, let's assume that that heat exchanger has some find of uh, uh, fouls. This is what it looks when the heat exchanger fouls. Um, uh, that is some function of time. And in, in, our, in our case, we assume that the heat exchanger fouling, this is the heat transfer resistance, is a function of time that is asymptotic. And it uh, looks like that, like the blue line. And uh, the question is, can we discover this if we have an accurate model for the system? Uh, so uh, uh, it's a energy balance across a heat exchanger. It's a dynamic system that's uh, actually very dynamic because the aircraft changes altitudes and and speeds and so on. Uh, so the heat exchanger has 125 differential algebraic equations after discretization through all the cells and so on in the heat exchanger. Uh, it has two hard sensors uh, uh, for the temperature at the exit of the heat exchanger. It has uncertainty in terms of moisture content and cold temperature because it flies at uh, variable altitude. And it has one fault that is the thermal fouling resistance that uh, we don't know. We're trying to discover the function, but in our synthetic experiments, we'll be using this function, a uh, asymptotic function for the thermal firing resistance. And uh, we would like to do fault prognosis. Uh, if we estimate what the function of the pro uh, progression of the fault is, then we can do fault pro prognostics and uh, uh, predict when the system will fail. So that's a very busy slide, but I'll give you the highlight of uh, uh, what we're doing here. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we're working on informa information theory to optimize the way we run a, a diagnostic test. And we came up with differential sensors, I'll show you in the next slide, soft sensors that actually use information theory to maximize, derive a function that maximizes the information with respect to a fault. And in this particular case is um, the uh, heat transfer resistance the heat, uh, heat, that expresses heat exchanger fouling. Then uh, we define some uh, fault and uh, failure baselines that are actually these horizontal lines that I presented earlier here. This is really defined by the system. At, at the 50% fouling, the heat exchanger is fouled and needs to be changed. And at, uh, this is corresponds to 80% fouling, it must be changed, it uh, uh, must be replaced. And um, uh, then uh, for prognostics, we need to discover how the fault progresses with time. And to discover that, we need to create some uh, function of time that will augment the system model that we have already. And the system model of 125 differential equations that I uh, discussed earlier. So all we're looking for is to add one more algebraic equation to 125 differential equations and integrate the system and validate the equation based on uh, the sensors that we have, either the inferential sensor or the hard sensors uh, by which uh, from which we measure uh, the uh, temperature of the heat exchanger. So for the inferential sensor, just to give you the highlight is uh, uh, through sensitivity analysis and estimation theory, we used what's called DS optimality criterion that utilizes the fission information matrix. This has this is applied over a very large system scale model, and that's why I'm presenting these slides to show you scalability. And it uses extensively automatic differentiation and other techniques to simplify how we do the computations of calculating uh, uh, DS optimality, the determinant of the fission information matrix, and so on. Um, the idea is to minimize the covariance be between parameter, fault parameters and certain parameters while neglect the covariance between the uncertain parameters because we're not trying to estimate uncertainty, we're just trying to estimate the fault and specifically the function of the fault later on. 
And the idea here is that we have a system model. We'll use uh, genetic programming to estimate some function for one of the parameters in the system model as a function of time. We'll integrate the system model with this new parameter, and then the, in the objective function, we'll try to minimize the uh, difference, uh, the squared error of this inferential sensor that we created earlier through symbolic regression again. So it's symbolic regression twice. The first is using information theory to find optimal sensors, or, uh, sensor optimal ways of sensor fusion uh, out of the data that are recorded. And the second time is to actually create an equation inside the model that describes the progression of the fault. And we'll be doing that uh, at uh, uh, variable time steps. So what I'm showing here in green is if we stop here, we have this information for uh, the fault as well as uh, uh, the soft and hard sensor. And we'll be trying to estimate the function of theta using all the data collected up to this point. So I'm showing, I'm going to show you all the results very quickly. Uh, so when we have just just a little bit of information and we try to evolve this uh, function and we get the function that, uh, uh, that looks like that, it's close to reality, but not very accurate. A rule is the remaining useful life. Uh, that is, uh, when I have only this information, it's estimated to be infinite. Uh, infinity, when the actual remaining useful life is about uh, uh, 325 minutes. And uh, the fall prognostics um, uh, has significant error as well. When that happens, it's uh, about 50% uh, wrong. Then as I start increasing the information that I allow, and I have a longer window from which I collected information, I do the same. I evolve a new function. The function looks like that, and then uh, inject that function into the system of equations that describe the system. Then I integrate the system, calculate the values of the inferential sensor, compare it to the actual values of the, of the sensor that uh, we collected, and then uh, we optimize and keep evolving that function using uh, symbolic regression, and we're getting closer and closer to actually prognosing the fault correctly. So this is the green line is what the estimated function would project in time. We're almost right. And as we keep providing more and more information, more and more data, that is a sliding window that keeps increasing. It's not a sliding window, it's an increasing width uh, window. Uh, then we have more than enough information to actually get the real function that is responsible for heat exchanger fouling. In a simpler way to present it is to actually show to you that uh, the remaining useful life, that's when the heat exchanger should be changed and how we predict that. Uh, starts um, uh, with some deviation from the true values, but very quickly converges to the actual value and uh, to zero error pretty much uh, uh, after uh, 50 minutes and five, uh, five iterations. So in summary, this hybrid approach where there is a, a component in the model that's evolved through symbolic regression, but there is a very large scale model that's integrated and uh, manipulated for predicting the remaining useful life of the system is very, very superior to other approaches like uh, uh, normal prognostic approaches that use some form of a degradation model. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that uh, our goal is to enable the discovery of physics from data and not very rich data sets, which is very common in engineering. Uh, automatic, uh, to some extent, we can automat automate the teaching of basic engineering principles through the extraction of uh, those from data domain expert knowledge, as in the example of analogous modeling and how we could actually explain to students as we teach how we could uh, derive this, uh, um, uh, these models from data as, uh, as long as we have some basic understanding of the key principles that govern that process, explore data-driven approaches that uh, provide unique new insights to process systems, uh, how did we do? Some methods uh, work. Computation complexity and scalability are the elephants in the room. We addressed those by utilizing concepts of automatic differentiation and other approaches that are common in PINN. And uh, uh, hybrid approaches that use few symbolic regression, scarce regression, PNN, etc., might be better suited in some cases, as we presented with a deep mode and PINN approaches. And as I presented to you in the method of characteristics example, sometimes the manipulation of the equations or the data are extre is extremely beneficial. And what we're doing right now is uh, uh, we try to further reduce and uh, eliminate the need for integration of ODEs and DAEs to finalize the work that I presented to you. And uh, uh, we want to study the importance of the accuracy of integrators when we do integration, because uh, for all I know, you don't need the best possible integrator like CVOD that we use in uh, in our approach uh, to integrate something cheaper and inexpensive might 
do just as well in discovering the occasions? I don't know the answer to that. That's an open question. With that, I think I'm out of time. And I thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, George. Uh, that was very nice and many, many, um, many, many information knowledge here. Um, okay, let's have a Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask your questions. Um, you don't have to, you know, wait for me. Maybe I can start. Um, for the for data, in order to use data, well, intentionally you develop the symbolic regression technique uh, to to be workable for the sparse data. As the data becomes sparse, uh, the position of the data uh, would be pretty important. Um, how do you determine those location of the of the data? There must there must be some optimal locations. Sometimes uh, that's a that's a good question, and we could do that by actually exploring the optimality or some information metric that yeah. relates to the location also. Um, and that's relatively inexpensive computation because as long as you're in the automatic differentiation, you can calculate the sensitivities inexpensively as well as long as as, as soon as you have a PD or OD system that describes your uh, uh, your system. Uh, in some cases, for instance, when you use the exit concentration, is what's usually available. No one measures concentrations inside a reactor because that's practically impossible. You usually have some some measurement device downstream the reactor. In some in some other cases, we uh, apply uh, completely random selection of uh, a measurement point of where we measure, and we repeated this uh, many times. But there is uh, an interesting point there, and it's not too much work actually to somehow yeah. find an optimal uh, point of uh, measurement right. or types of data that you need in addition to as as we evolve the model. Right, right. Okay, so in, in the future, maybe you can incorporate that um, yeah. into your your methods. Well, I mean, I do have uh, some recommendation for that. There is a you know point selection algorithm like a DIM and SOP and etc. So I I can probably um, email you uh, with those references and we can. Oh, please do so. Actually, by the side, I was giving a presentation to Karnyadakis's group in Brown mm -hmm. a few months ago, and they said you shouldn't be using, we're using uh, almost exclusively DEEP at that point, and they said you shouldn't be using DEEP, you should be using by SR because it makes life so easier, so now we're using both. So please provide feedback. We actually take it very seriously. Okay. <laughs> recommendations. All right. Awesome. Um, okay. On, another question from me would be um because because of my fault um i missed the i missed the point where you use the physics uh to derive the the symbolic regression so, so i in my head okay you, you you try to use the symbolic regressions to find out the physics but somehow you use the physics again to help the the symbolic regression so do, do you see the circle here, which one is first, and so exactly. how how does all those components are? I'm not sure. What what together? Here, or so you so the the idea of using the symbol regression is you do not know the the PDE, right? You you try to come you know find yeah. out the unknown PDE. For half of the talk, we don't know anything about the PDE, but you know yeah. something about the physics that govern the occasions. Uh, uh, this is some partial you... knowledge about the physics. So you you try to use that, yeah. and then. Uh, but uh, it could be like in this example that in the slide I'm sharing here that you know part of the PD, uh, but uh, you don't know the function of U, and you want to comp combine that with actual data, or it could be as in the heat exchanger fouling example where you know the system in insane accuracy or yeah. uh, fidelity, but. Uh, uh, there is one component in the system that's unknown, and you try to evolve that that component. So we we it depends on the problem statement, but we've shown that it works regardless. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so I, I when when I look at this slide, I was not following what this PD plus data means. Yeah, plus okay, data so means the data this function, and yes, we. Uh, no, we have it's data. my fault. Yeah. 
it's it's exactly it's, it's exactly how inverse pin works. Like you have the PD, but you don't know the parameters, and you also have data. So you estimate the parameters and the function uh, at the same time. And we were doing this mostly because we identified that integration is by far the most expensive step, as you could imagine, uh, in partial differential equations. Uh, so we wanted to really test uh, how we're doing the symbolic regression using the exact same principles and concepts that uh, PNN, inverse PNN uses. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, you also mentioned the sparse regression technique, like the CIMD, weak CIMD, and also you compare your results with a, um, you know, your symbolic regression uh, technique. Um, as you also mentioned, Lawrence Livermore, we have developed a DSO as well, and we do have some experience of, uh, run, run, you know, running uh, those DSO algorithm. Um, the the symbolic regression, from my express impressions, it gives you those important terms um, using those primitive operators. They they know how to combine them. Which which you cannot do with a simple you know you know sparse regression technique because you have to know the the terms the, as a user you have to provide them so I, I and a lot of times when you run the um, DSO I mean the, the tools we have developed uh, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab um, it does give you those those terms exactly so um, at the end you, you get the solution from DSO and then apply the sparse regression to find out, you know, those coefficient in front of those, those terms. That, that seems to work well, but from your work, I guess you don't need the, uh, the sparse regression, like the second, second, second trial of the, uh, the sparse regression. It's every, even the, you can get the precise coefficient. As we create, we come up with a problem statement, like really all these problems are synthetic, right? And uh, you know the solution before you start, and it's actually not fair in many cases. But right, right, right. as we create these uh, 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 problem statements, uh, we have a degree of freedom there to say that much I know, that much I don't know. I don't know. I know that there will be a diffusion term, so I'll force it in there. But I don't know the, uh, the reaction term. That's the example I showed with the method of characteristics, where the reaction term can be anything, right? And uh, there was nothing in the basis functions that would uh, let me get there. That would uh, imply that uh, this is this this was found by symbolic regression. So uh, there is so many different forms and functions that uh, could uh, dominate or govern a system that um, you don't necessarily know. If it's things as simple as uh, finding the square of C, as in this case, yes, past regression. That, I mean, you can augment, ter add terms, more and more terms as basis functions as past regression. It will work just, just as fine. But uh, there is so many cases that uh, it's uh, it's very unknown. And there is also other cases where I didn't present it here, but it's not so much about finding the ground truth, but it's about finding models that... Uh, are explainable. You can read through them, identify a little bit of truth, but not exactly identical to whatever it is the governing equation. Uh, we were discussing earlier about the manufacturing case. That is also the case when you use data like the frequency, uh, the um, uh, audio data in the frequency domain, then you lose any connection to physics. What does it mean, right? Or wavelet transforms of the audio data and things like that. It means nothing to humans. Uh, but the frequency of those things can, uh, as they identified and selected by symbolic regression, sometimes it means something. It tells you a little bit, and you can at least still read the equation. That's the beauty of uh, uh, symbolic regression. But then you will have to build models that you don't know what they are, and sparse regression would yeah. never serve that purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the nice thing about the uh, the symbolic regressions. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I asked too many questions. I'm, I I do have more questions, but. Let's let's give audiences some chance. Is there any questions um, from audience? You can unmute yourself, ask questions. Well, if not, I'm, let me ask one more question. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, you know the. Okay, this is you know. 
um, directly using data and then come up with a governing equations of that data directly, right? Um, a lot of times, you know, this, in, in terms of, in the context of developing a surrogate model or reducible model, so the goal of those uh, those model is try to accelerate the existing simulations, right? Um, there, um, recently we have developed, uh, you know, algorithms so called the last day, uh, latent space dynamic uh, dynamics identification. We do use a, you know, this symbolic regression or sparse regression uh, technique, but in the latent space, not not on the not in the uh, actual, you know, physical space. Um, the reason is that. Um, because we know how to solve it, but the problem, the motivation of those, the development of those methods was um, the expensive, you know, computational cost, right? So, and, and that comes from the high dimensionality um, after the discretization. So, as you generate the data that, you know, the data in space time everywhere, like very, so we have a abundant of data, but the thing is, it's, it's very high dimensional. So what we did was we compressed that data into the reduced space by using linear compression or nonlinear compression, and then we apply this uh, symbolic regression or sparse regressions, and that tends to work pretty well. And it was perfect to apply those symbolic or you know this, this, um, the sparse regression in the latent space because we do not know the underlying governing equations for the for that latent space. Um, maybe this method, your your symbolic regression uh, approach is very useful um, in that context as well. I, I guess this is just the comments rather than the questions. We had um, something along the lines of, um, I mean, you're trying to describe model reduction or surrogate modeling and model yeah. approximation. Yeah. Uh, um, there is very interesting uh, extensions of how you could combine information theory, principles of identifiability and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so on uh, with uh, symbolic regression to actually find informative models and also define optimally the samples that you use for the for the reduction. Mm -hmm. An elephant in the room there is that usually you need a large data set. So yeah. we actually had a project that uh, took about three months of Monte Carlo simulation over a CFD model mm -hmm. uh, to just generate the data. And every time we wanted to change the parameter in the high fidelity model, we need another three months. So it's, it's, it's quite challenging. So uh, it's, it's very interesting. It's, um, uh, I think I read a little bit of, of your work and it's a very interesting extension of, uh, uh, of work of, uh, of some of these models and some of these approaches to simulate. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, do Do you know Pat Lange at, at Stanford University? I'm not personally. I think. Oh, I've... okay. So I, I guess you had heard of him. I guess Is he, he's he's into this this um, area, like a physics discovery or the discovery algorithm in general um so we, we uh, had uh hot lips on a few many years ago uh was the they had eureka back in the day they had him and made some really good papers and a lot of noise on that because before it became a company and then they stopped publishing altogether but uh yeah there is there's some very interesting works in the same field and, right 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 all right okay uh let me stop here um and uh, if there is no further questions, let's let's thank our speaker, um, George, for the wonderful talk, and hopefully we can collaborate in the future. Yeah, hopefully we can. Yeah, thank awesome. you very much for the invitation. And okay. it was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you, George. Okay, have a good day. Bye.